Let us pray. Lord, we come to you in this time. We give you thanks and praise that, that you are with us, that you give us your word, that you instruct us and help us to understand what is true and right and, and good, who we are and, and who you are and the relationship we have with you. Lord, we ask your blessing upon this time. Open our hearts and minds. Lead us into your very presence. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. It is quite common when talking about kids and their parents to hear phrases like, he is athletic, like his father. She has the same giving spirit as her parents. Her height comes from her mom's side of the family. He looks just like his dad. These statements are very common because they are image bearer statements, meaning that we bear the image of our parents, our kids bear our image, and on and on down the line. Here, as we get to 1 Corinthians 15, 30 to 50, we're going to see that, that up to this point, Paul has been talking against those who are saying there is no resurrection. Paul is saying, this thinking is absurdity. And so he's arguing against those who are saying there is no resurrection. And even today, we see people continue to think this, to, to say this, that they don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. But Paul attacks here their questioning about the resurrection. He teaches us and challenges us that we need to, to think in a way that leads us to to be willing to even endanger ourselves for the sake of the gospel and to bear the very image of Christ. There's a picture of a family, right? Child like their parents. Well, last Sunday I went with a friend of mine to Venice Beach. If you know anything about Venice Beach, it is one of the most visited places in California. And on top of that, it has probably almost every kind of person you can imagine that is there at Venice Beach. It is quite the spectacle. And my friend, he set up a table, put some New Testaments on the table that we we're going to hand out, and we waited for people to come so that we share the gospel with them. And the people did come. They came and they, and they inquired about the New Testaments. And as they talked about the New Testament, to, and we had an opportunity to, to share the gospel with them and, and even to, to pray with them. Now, I confess that I haven't done anything quite like that in a while. And it was a reminder to me about how many people do not believe in Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And even though they stopped at the table, even though they were inquiring about what we were doing, even though they were, though they were asking about the New Testaments, they did not agree with what we said. In fact, there was one person who was yelling at one of the members of, of our group, and he was yelling out, Jesus did not raise from the dead. And then he said, and he was yelling this, and then he said, you are deceiving the people, and because of this, you're going to hell. This is what he was yelling at the member of our group. That's how animated, angry he was at what we were sharing. You know, the apostle Paul encountered this all the time when he went from city to city, didn't he? He would go there and he would preach the gospel. He would tell them about the good news of the resurrection, about salvation in Christ. He says in verse 34, or 30 to 31, And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why would he face ridicule, arguments, endangerment? Why would we? Because he believes, and he's trying to help us understand that in our belief, we need to understand that it is worth suffering whatever we might suffer for the purpose of helping people who do not know Jesus understand who Jesus is and how salvation is found through him, how power is found through his resurrection. We understand that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. 
We understand that in Christ we have meaning and purpose in our life. And we want to help others to understand this as well. That in Christ we have salvation. In Christ we have meaning and purpose. And we believe it is worth suffering to get this truth out to a world that is lost and that is hurting. Even though we were in Venice and there were many who didn't believe what we, what we were saying, there was a number of people who were, were thankful that we were there. They were taking the Bibles. They were thankful for the Word of God. They were listening to our words. And we had opportunity to pray for many people. It was a wonderful experience. And, and I will be going again. And if you'd like to go with me, just let me know. And we figure out a time when we go. My friend goes every Sunday. He's been doing this for 21 years. Every Sunday, going to Venice Beach to preach the gospel. And he's seen many people come to know Jesus because of his ministry. And I'm excited that he's going to be one of our speakers in Missions Month. So you're going to hear more about his story and many of the people who have come to know Jesus because of his ministry. But you know, there is a very different attitude from those who do not know Jesus. Paul talks about non-believers when he says, if the de- this is what they say, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So many people have this attitude, right? That life is just about partying and merriment and not taking it too seriously. And, and because of that, they just do whatever they want to do, right? But at the same time, they feel lost and they feel hopeless and they don't know what to do about it. This is a common theme in music, I know there's many songs that talk about this, but when I think about this theme and I think about music, the song that, and I'm going to date myself, right? But the song that always comes to mind is Billy Joel's Only the Good Die Young. And the chorus says this, They say there's a heaven for those who will wait. Some say it's better, but I say it ain't. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. You know, only The good die young. This is a sentiment of Billy Joel and and so many others along the centuries have basically said, you know, it's more fun to sin. It's more fun to hang out with those who sin. But Paul challenges us when he says in verses 15, 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. When you subject yourself to false teaching, to sinful behavior, to immoral living, you are allowing yourself to be influenced by bad company. We're told to be in the world, but not of the world. We don't hide from the world, but we are to partake of the sin of the world. And so Paul responds to this by saying in verse 34, come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some of you who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. I'm thankful along the years of how God brings people from time to time into my life to keep me accountable, to help me from going astray, or when I do go astray, to bring me back in line. And one of the most profound experiences that I've ever had in this, and I, and I still remember it very clearly, is when I was in high school. Now, when I was in high school, I wasn't particularly popular. But when I went to this one music camp this one summer, for whatever reason, I became popular at the music camp. And I didn't know how to deal with that. And so I became very stuck up. I thought I was this amazing person, even greater than, you know, God would want me to think, right? And I started acting stuck up, and I changed who I was. And my best friend came up to me one day, and he said, you're changing. You're not the same person. I don't like who you've become. And I just kind of pushed it off. I didn't really think about it. I didn't really acknowledge him in that. And he could see that. And then he looked at me straight in the eye. I'll never forget him saying this to me. He said, if you don't change, I won't be your friend anymore. Wow, those are powerful words, right? And he walked away. And that made me stop. And it made me think. And it made me try to reflect on what changed. How was I behaving differently? 
And I'm thankful for that because whenever God brings people in my life to do that, it makes me stop and reflect, where have I gone astray? Where is there sin in my life? Where am I not rocking down that path that God has for me? See, this is, in essence, what Paul was saying here. He's saying, because of the resurrection, you can stop sinning. So do it. Don't sin. Hang out with those who will lead you into the, the right way to live, not those who will corrupt your good behavior. Stop hanging around those who sin. And so our first point is that by word and deed, we are to live for and boast about Christ. Paul then moves on to the next section where he gives more reasoning for the resurrection of what we will be like after the resurrection. And so he says in verses 38 to 41, but God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another. Birds, another, and fish, another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another kind. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. This is really an intriguing passage where Paul helps us to see the complexity of what God has done in, this, in his creation. Up to this point, Paul has been giving us instruction on the truth of the resurrection, of Christ's bodily resurrection, and what it means for our own bodily resurrection in Christ. Paul is doing this because he knows that if we don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ, we will lose our motivation and our incentive to live the Christian life, to live the life that God has called us to live. We'll lose the understanding of how our life here on this earth is connected to eternal life. They're connected. And he wants us to understand that. Thus, we must die daily to our sinful desires and be raised in life for this life and for the life to come. He goes on to talk about the different kind of bodies to show how God designs each part of the world and the world to come with a specific design, with a unique purpose, with precision. Paul gives a wonderful description of each part of creation that he's created. He's created it with a purpose, with a design. Each creature with its own body, right? Fish are different than birds. Human bodies are different than spiritual bodies. Heavenly bodies and earthly bodies are different. The sun and the moon and the stars differ in their, their splendor and their glory and their majesty. Fish cannot live on the earth as they were not designed to do this. And humans cannot live in the ocean as they were not designed for this. Each is unique. Each is designed by God for a purpose. Paul explains all of this so he can make the point of the difference between our earthly body and the body we will receive when we go to heaven. After we die, this resurrection body that God will give us, raised to eternal life. Again, God designs our heavenly body for the purpose of our living in heaven for eternity with God, for that purpose. And so he says in verses 42 to 47, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There also is a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. C.S. Lewis writes about the resurrection body, the picture is not what we expected. It is not the picture of an escape from any kind of nature into something unconditioned and under, utterly transcendent life. 
It is a picture of a new human nature and a new nature in general being brought into existence. That is the picture, not of unmaking, but of remaking. God will remake us with heavenly bodies for the purpose of living in heaven for eternity with God. That remaking of our our beings for that purpose. We're raised in power even though we have been born in sin. We were born this natural body that you see here, but we'll be raised into a spiritual body, which is immortal and glorious and incorruptible. And all this gives us perspective and hope. And so our second point is that the resurrection of Christ brings us resurrection and a new body. And then he concludes this section here with these verses. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. As Adam brought sin into the world, we, when we are born, are born into this nature to sin. As I talked about last week, we have this original sin in us. We have the nature, the inclination to sin. But as Christ is heavenly, when we accept Christ as our Savior and our Lord, He gives us this spiritualness, this righteousness that He imparts to us to help us to become spiritual and holy like him. Reformed theologian John Calvin says, So we shall be conformed to Christ in the heavenly nature, and this will be the completion of our restoration. For we now begin to bear the image of Christ and are every day more and more transformed into it. But that image consists in spiritual regeneration. But then it will be fully restored, both in body and in soul. And what is now begun will be perfected. And accordingly, we will obtain in reality what we as yet only hope for. We are created in the image of God, but our sin keeps us from fully living into that image. In Christ, we can be transformed to bear the image of God. I have some friends whose daughter has gotten into drugs. And of course, as you can imagine, it has distressed them very greatly. They're very sad to see their daughter living in this way for many reasons, but for one reason it's because that she can't live into being that person that they have raised her to be. And she can't be that person who God created her to be. These drugs that she's taking are keeping her from being able to bear the image of Christ. And the only hope she has to bear the image of Christ, and the only hope that we have to bear the image of Christ, is to live for Christ, to receive his salvation and his presence and his power and the very spirit of God living within us. The priority of God's work in Christ is what produces a glorified and resurrected people who will bear the image of his Son, which is what we are called to do. The command to do the work of the Lord not only comes from the the relationship that we have with Christ and and the strengthening of that relationship day to day, but it is shaped by Christ as we give ourselves over to the power of the resurrection, which makes a difference in how we live. And so our third point is that in Christ we become image bearers of Christ's image. There's a teacher named Dr. Christensen. He was a professor of religion at a small college and every year he taught this class that was a survey for Christianity. And his goal every year was to explain the gospel to the students so that they would understand that they, in Christ, had forgiveness and they had salvation. But the freshmen had to take this class. And because they had to take this class, they looked at it as drudgery. They didn't really put much into it. It was a required class. 
they didn't really look to enjoy or learn from this class. Well, this one particular semester, the teacher got an idea. And so he grabbed one of the students named Steve, a really big football player, and he worked out this deal with Steve. And so the last day of class came, and the students walked in, and there are all these filled donuts. You can imagine that they looked at that with delight, right? Oh, I can't wait to have one of those. And then Dr. Christensen said to the class, there is a little catch, though. For you to receive a donut, Steve here will have to do 10 push-ups for you. And so he went up to the first student and he said, would you like a donut? And he said, yes, I would. So the teacher, Dr. Christensen looked over at Steve. Steve got down, did 10 push-ups, and Dr. Christensen put the donut on the student's desk. He went to the next student, would you like a donut? And she said, yes. And so Steve got down, did 10 push-ups, and he put the donut on the desk. Well, this went on for a while, but then the students started to look at Steve, and they, they saw how tired he was getting. And they, start to, they started to feel bad that Steve was going to have to do all these push-ups for them to receive a donut. So some of the students started saying, no. Do you want a donut? No. And the teacher said, well, Steve, why don't you do the push-ups for him anyway? He might want a donut. And so Steve got down and did the push-ups, and on and on it went. And by this time, the class was getting really uncomfortable as they watched Steve struggle more and more. Even a couple of the girls started to cry as, as they saw him just sweating and, and just struggling. One of the students raised his hand and said, can I help Steve? Can I do some of the push-ups for him? And then she said, no, this is a deal we worked out ahead of time. Steve has to do all the push-ups. Then they got to the 29th student and the 30th and the last student. And finally, Steve barely was able to get that last push-up done. And all the students had a donut on their desk. And then Dr. Christensen said this to the class. And so it was that our Savior Jesus Christ, on the cross, pled to the Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. With the understanding that he had done everything that was required of him, he yielded up his life. And like some of those in this room, many of us leave the gift on the desk uneaten. As Steve did the work for the students so that they could earn the donut, so Christ has done the work for us so that we can receive salvation. That by faith, we receive salvation, and by the resurrection, we receive the very power of God. But many don't understand what the crucifixion and the resurrection means for them. They do not want it. They, they leave it on the table. We are called image bearers of Christ to share the truth and the love and the light of Christ to a hurting and a lost world. One of the best things about being a Christ follower is that we can be transformed by Christ so that his light and his love and his goodness can shine through us to those who do not understand what Christ has done. Ultimately, when we die, we will have a resurrected body, a perfect resurrected body. It's interesting, both Norman and Doug this morning remarked about how they're not perfect, right? And that's true. Because of our sin, we're not perfect. But in heaven, we will have this perfect resurrected body. But until then, we need to be image bearers of Christ, which only can happen when we allow Christ and the power of the resurrection to work in and through our life so that we can show this world that there is hope, there is love, there is goodness that can come when we live in faith in Christ. And so I pray that you would seek this week to be a little more intentional about being an image bearer for Christ and shine that example to those around you. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you and we just give you thanks that Jesus has indeed sacrificed himself on the cross so that we can have salvation and he's been raised from the dead so that his power could reign through us. Lord, help us to be an image bearer of Christ. Help us to shine the light of Christ, the love of Christ to others. 
Help us to walk faithfully with Christ so that we would do this faithfully, Lord. And so we give you thanks and we give you praise for all that you do for us. And it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.